All right, we'll just go from the beginning. All right. All right, so today we are continuing with the series that we've been in for the past few weeks called Breakthrough Prayer. We've talked about what does it look like for God's will to break through in our lives, to break through in our relationships, at our jobs, break through our sin, break through our fear, break through our resistance. And I know a lot of us have been praying recently for God to just come and break through in the midst of this coronavirus that we're all facing. And you know, when it comes to prayer, one of the most common questions I tend to get from people is, how do I pray? Right, for a lot of people, prayer is just an uncomfortable thing. They don't know where to begin. They don't know what to pray for. They don't know when to pray. They don't know what they should say and what they shouldn't say. And so I thought we would begin this message today by just going through a little bit of a training session on prayer. This past week, I found a really great video that just highlights some key ways that Christians tend to pray. And I just think you might enjoy this to so see if any of these really click and connect with you. Let's watch it. Lord Jesus, I just want to thank you, Lord Jesus, for this day, Lord Jesus, and all your wonderful, Lord Jesus, things that you, Lord Jesus, do for us, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord Jesus. Okay, uh, I just want to thank you for Annie and Sarah and Molly. I know that with your strength, we can change the world! We can change the world! Woo! Venus. Earth, Mars, and we give you the praise. Yes, Jesus. We cannot wait to see what you're going to yes. do today. And we are excited. Aunt Margaret's really nasty hangnail. And I worship you forever. God, I, uh, I just, uh... Um, toilet paper, deodorant. Speaking of, I need to get some more. Hey God, uh, thanks for bringing us here today. Thank you for all the stuff that you're gonna do in our lives. Uh, the way you're gonna work is absolutely amazing and we are super amped for everything that you hold for us. I just don't know what to say. Hey God, man, you're great. Help me find a mate. Amen. Look at this. Oh. Salt, garlic salt, sea salt, kosher salt. God, just. Just let your doves of knowledge flow from under our fingernails of repentance. So which one do you guys want to try first? Uh, do you want to do the interrupting prayer while I'm praying? You just want to kind of kick in there? Or do you want me to, I can do a confusing prayer. I'm really good for a confusing prayer. Or maybe I should just get up. It's like, what do, you, what do you want to do? You know, but the thing about it is that, that prayer is a challenging thing for us a lot of times. All right, we just don't really know where to begin with it. And so what we want to do today is to give you a tool that is going to help you to pray. It's a tool that we call a prayer calendar. And that's what this day, uh, message today is all about. It's about how to create a prayer calendar. Now, I got to confess to you right up front that this prayer calendar tool we're giving you, this is not necessarily a biblical tool, right? We don't find this in the Bible. We don't see Jesus breaking his prayers down by day. Right? We don't see him saying something like, well, well on Monday I'm going to pray for Peter, and on Tuesday John, Thursday, or sorry, Wednesday James, on Thursday I'm going to pray for Martha because she's just really getting on my nerves right now, Friday Mary because I kind of owe her for that perfume, I'm going to devote Saturday and Sunday to Judas because that boy's going to need both of those days of prayer. Right? Like, we don't see Jesus do that, but what we do see 
is Jesus constantly taking time to pray. I mean, he will leave crowds of thousands of people and go off and pray. We see prayer constantly mentioned throughout Scripture. The Psalms are practically an entire book about prayer. We can tell that prayer is an important part of our lives. And so what I want to begin with today is really talking about why that is. Before we can learn about this tool that's going to help us to pray, we've got to learn why we're praying and what God's really trying to do in the midst of that prayer. And so the passage that we're going to look at today comes from a book in the Bible called 1 Thessalonians. And to give you a little bit of context of this, right, when you hear something like 1 Thessalonians, that means it is a letter written to a church in a particular city, in this case, a, a city called Thessalonica, right? And so if you were reading Ephesians, it's a church in a city called Ephesus, Romans is to the church in Rome, and this is a letter by a pastor named Paul to a church in a city called Thessalonica. And what you should know about this church is that there's a whole lot of, like, fighting going on within this church, which is just like crazy to me because I've never seen church people fight, right? I mean, like church people all love each other. Like from what I hear, choosing the color of the carpet is the most holy experience you can go through in a church, right? But for some reason, this church in Thessalonica is just really, really struggling. And what we see is Paul giving them an idea, them some wisdom and advice on how they can handle this situation and what God's really calling them to do through prayer in this situation. And so let's look at it together. We're going to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we're going to start with verses 16 through 18, and we're just going to kind of take this piece by piece and see what God's teaching us through Paul's letter. So here's how it begins. It says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Let's keep that up there. I just want to see that. I want you to notice what he's saying here, right? He's telling us to rejoice always. He's telling us to pray continually. He's telling us to give thanks. And look at what he's saying. He's saying doing these things, rejoicing, praying, giving thanks, all of this is God's will for us. It is God's will that we would do these things. And what he's really trying to get at here is our first lesson, which is this. Lesson number one today about prayer is this. Prayer reminds us of God's goodness. If you're following along in your message notes, this is one of your first fill-ins. Prayer reminds us of God's goodness. You see, to this congregation full of people who are fighting with one another over who knows what, He's saying, I want you to rejoice. I want you to pray continually. I want you to give thanks. Right? And what he's calling them to do is in the midst of this situation that they're facing, in the midst of all these problems that they've got with one another, in the midst of this world where all they can think about is the negative and why they're upset, he's saying, my, my purpose for you is for prayer to call you back to me. Prayer is meant to help you to rejoice in the midst of this situation that you're facing, in the midst of your frustration, right? It's saying, even though all you can think about is how angry you are at the people around you, I want you to rejoice in me. I want you to give thanks for the things that I've done. I want you to celebrate my goodness. I want you to look back and reflect on the ways that I've grown this church, on the ways that I've transformed your lives. I want you to remember the moments that I brought you together, the way that my Holy Spirit has inspired you and empowered you and transformed your life. I want you to be thinking about that instead of just how everything is falling apart. And that's what God is calling us to do. Right? Have you ever had that moment, that period in your life where you just got so hung up on the negative? And you just got lost in the negative? Like when it came to your health, all you could think about was just how bad your health was. Like, woe is me. You're like, everything's falling apart. Didn't matter if some parts of your health were doing perfectly fine. All you could focus on was the negative, right? Or at your job. You know, all you could think about was the things that were going wrong at your job. It didn't matter if there were parts of your job that you loved. It didn't matter if there were some things that were going really great in your job. All you could think about was the negative. You just got lost in it. Maybe you do that in your relationships sometimes. Right? You look at people who you love, but all you see are their mistakes. All you see are the ways that they mess up. You don't praise all the great things they're doing. You just focus on the negative, right? When you pray for your spouse, you're like, dear God, thank you for my husband. And what I mean by thank you for my husband is thank you for giving him me because that man can't do anything right, right? 
uh, and you just get so lost in the negative. I mean, I have a feeling right now, I'm noticing this all around, so many of us are really struggling not to get lost in the negative when it comes to the coronavirus. Right? We're stuck at home all day. Some people are stuck at home with their kids, and all of a sudden, they become stay-at-home parents. Or we're having to work at home, and, and that's really difficult. We're not able to go to restaurants and places that we want, and we just focus on all the things we've lost. Instead of opening our eyes up, And seeing the opportunities that God is placing before us. Some of the beautiful things that God could be doing. And that's why why God is saying, hey, in the midst of the negative, what prayer is meant to do is to call you to rejoice in me. Call you back to giving thanks in me. Calling you back to celebrating all the good things that I've done. In the midst of these situations, when you've gotten lost in the negative, prayer is meant to call you back to what I've done. To call you back to celebrate me and rejoice in the work that I'm doing in your lives. And so that's one of the purposes of prayer, right? It calls us to rejoice in God's goodness. It calls us back to rejoice and not just be focused on the negative sometimes. And then look at what Paul says prayer is also powerful for. Look at what he says next in this next section. He tells us, do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. So do not quench the spirit, and do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all, right? So all of a sudden, Paul makes this shift, and now he's talking about the Holy Spirit, and he's talking about this idea of prophecies. And so I'm going to explain to you what he means by quench the spirit in just a moment, but let me focus on that word prophecies, because a lot of times we get, we get uh, confused by that word prophecies. We assume that when we hear prophecies, it's like fortune telling, right? It's like predicting the future. We think of the prophecies about Jesus, and they all predicted this coming Messiah in the future. And that is what prophecies can be sometimes. But there are so many other times in Scripture where prophecy isn't predicting the future. Prophecy is a word that God's people need to hear in the moment. And so let me define prophecy for you so we understand what he's saying here, because this is really important. When he says the word prophecy, this is what he's talking about. When he says prophecy, he means hard truths being spoken to people which call them back to God. Hard truths that are being spoken to people which call them back to God. To God, right? So when when prophets would come, sometimes they would predict things that would be happening in the future, but sometimes they were just speaking to people in the moment, and a prophet was giving the people a hard truth that they needed to hear that would call them back to God, right? When the people had gone astray, when their hearts had strayed away from God, the prophet would tell them something they needed to hear in that moment, and it would call their hearts back to God. And so what Paul is saying here, why he's drawing our attention to things like quenching the Spirit and paying attention to prophecies and testing prophecies is he saying that one of the important purposes of prayer is to hear God speak. And sometimes prayer is an opportunity for us to hear hard truths from God, to hear the Holy Spirit speak to us, to hear God speak prophetically into our lives, which is why lesson number two is this. Lesson number two is that prayer helps us to discern God's voice. Prayer helps us to discern God's voice. Right? What there is is this assumption that God is speaking prophetically through prayer, that God wants to speak to us, that the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us. So we don't quench the Spirit because that's quenching the voice of God. We pay attention to the prophecies because the prophecies are the voice of God. It's this assumption when we pray that God is trying to speak. But let me ask you, when you pray, do you assume God is trying to speak? I mean, I'll be honest, when I pray, I hope God is speaking. I want God to speak, but I'm not not sure that I assume God is speaking. I assume God is listening, but I'm not sure that I assume God is speaking. It's kind of like my daughter, right? I have this... Uh, one of my daughters is um, one of those kids who, who just interrupts sometimes. Have you ever noticed that? And I mean, she's a wonderful kid, but, but there are times where my wife and I will be talking, and it's as if she doesn't realize that we're speaking. 
Right? Like we could be talking about how we're all going to move to Antarctica and live with the penguins. Right? Or we're going to be talking, we could be talking about how we're going to adopt a clown and let him live in our house or something, you know, crazy like that. And she won't hear a word of it. Right? She'll just come up and start asking her question or telling us what she thinks we want to hear. Right? But, but when I come to speak to her, when I come to tell her something, if I had to come to her and say something like, hey, it's time to go to bed, or hey, Emma, you really need to make sure to go back and eat your vegetables, it's like she doesn't hear a word I'm saying. <laughs> and when I like press her and I you know, push her to listen to what I'm saying, all of a sudden she gives me this look like, what, you talk? Right? Like she assumes I'm listening when she wants to talk to me, but, but when it comes time for me to talk to her, it's just as if she doesn't even realize I can talk sometimes. And funny enough, that is the way that we treat God sometimes. We go to God and we expect that God is listening when we pray. Right? We, we just let our hearts out there to God. We share with God everything that we're thinking. But do we assume that God is trying to speak? Right? Like, Have you ever had that moment when you're praying and all of a sudden you, you kind of begin to feel the Holy Spirit speaking or you look back on your life and you realize that God was saying something and you missed it and you look up and you're like, what? When did you learn to speak? Right? When, when did you start talking? Because we just don't assume that God is talking. And if you remember last week, we talked about how one of the important practices when it comes to prayer that we can do when prayer prevails in our lives is we can just spend the first part of our prayer listening. Maybe it's 30 seconds, maybe it's a few minutes, but just sitting in silence and listening to God. Because what, what this passage is teaching us is that one of the important purposes of prayer is to help us to discern God's voice, to discern what God's saying, and we can't do that if we're not listening. But then finally, Paul tells us that there's one other really important purpose in prayer, and look at what he says. He says, hold on to what is good, reject every kind of evil. He goes on to say this. He says, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through, May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he ends it with, the one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Right, so in this passage, he's talking about this idea of rejecting evil, holding on to what is good, being sanctified. Right, and what he's getting at here is our third lesson about prayer, which is this. The purpose of prayer, the power of prayer is lesson number three, which is that prayer calls us to repent and seek salvation. One of the primary purposes of prayer is to call us to repent and to seek salvation. Prayer calls us to repent and to seek salvation. You see, what, what this is teaching us is that prayer is this reminder that when Jesus saved us, that wasn't the end of the story. Right? Like anybody out there, when, when you accepted Jesus Christ into your life as your Lord and Savior, any of you become perfect? Any of you totally stop sinning? Any of you just, just totally stop screwing up anything in your life? Anybody become perfect and stop needing saving? Right? None of us. Right? And if you did, I would love to talk to you because I haven't figured this out yet. Right? What I know is that even though we can accept Jesus into our lives as our Lord and Savior, we need him to save us every single day. One of the things we see in Scripture is it doesn't necessarily talk about us, us having a moment of salvation. It talks about us being saved, as if salvation is something that happens on a daily basis. And what, what Paul is reminding us of here is that prayer is always an opportunity to call us back to that, to call us to repent, to call us to seek God's salvation. And so it might look like this, right? When you're praying for your family, when you're praying for the people that you love, instead of just saying, dear God, please bless this person or please keep this person safe, or even just, dear God, thank you for this person. Right? It's also this opportunity for us to say, but God, please open my eyes. Right? And if there's a place where I've wronged the people in my life, if there's a place where I'm neglecting somebody that I love, if there's a place where I haven't honored them and respected them, then I, I repent to you, God. I put that before you. I ask for your forgiveness. I'm going to go ask for their forgiveness. Show me what I've done wrong. And then it's this realization of God, but if I'm going to do this right, I need you to save me. 
I need you to do what I can't do myself, and I surrender myself to you to let you be my Lord and my Savior in this situation. Right? Or maybe it comes to your health. You know, and when, you, when you're giving thanks for your health, or maybe you're praying for, you know, some situation that you're going through, it's also the opportunity to say, God, but where have I not really honored my body? Where have I not treated it like the temple that you told me that it is? Where do I need to seek your forgiveness and how I'm taking care of myself? And then, God, I need your strength to save me so that I can take better care of it and honor this gift that you've given me. Or when you're praying for your church, God, where have I neglected my church? Where have I not lived up to my membership vows? Where am I not loving every person in this congregation? Where am I not being your hands and feet in the community? God, open my eyes to this. I repent of this. And I need your strength and salvation to help me to do what I know you've called me to do. That's what prayer is. It's this opportunity to call upon God, to forgive us, to repent of the things we've done wrong, and to seek salvation. And here's the thing. It's not meant to just make you feel awful. Right? Like, prayer's not meant to just make you think, oh man, I'm a terrible person, and look at all the things I've done wrong. It's this reminder that Jesus is always saving you. That the same power that rose Jesus from the dead on Easter still exists, that the same God who saved you the first time can keep on saving you every single day. And that your hope, your salvation is not in trying to do this all yourself. Your journey is not over. But every day God can make you new. God can give you hope through the power of the resurrection and turn you into the new new creation that God intended you to be. It's this beautiful opportunity to invite God in every single day. And so what we see in just these few verses right here is that there are three really powerful lessons when it comes to prayer. Let's review them real quick, right? The important purposes of prayer is that prayer is a time spent recalling and celebrating God's goodness. The next thing we see is that prayer is also a time spent listening for God's voice and discerning what God's saying, really paying attention and hearing God. And then finally, the last thing we saw is that prayer is also time that is spent repenting and embracing salvation. What we see here is that prayer is an incredible gift in our lives. That prayer can transform us. That these are elements that should be in every single one of our prayers. And now what we want to do, what I want to do, is I want to share with you a tool that will help you to incorporate these. A tool that will really help you to build prayer into your daily life. This tool called a prayer calendar. And what we realize is there's actually three steps to forming a prayer calendar. If you remember last week, this was one of the action steps that I gave you, right? To create a prayer calendar, and I gave you a little bit of information on it. Well, this week I'm going to help you go even deeper and see what it really takes to form a prayer calendar. So here's step one. If you're going to create a prayer calendar, you're fill in here. Step one is that you first have to determine who. And what that means is you've got to determine who you're going to pray for, right? Who is it that you are going to lift up in prayer? And here's why this is important, right? Because it's so easy to just get lost in praying for the same few things. If you remember last week, we talked about how there are like three things in our lives. Our top three things tend to be the things we pray about 75 to 90% of the time. They get almost all of our attention. And so when you sit down and you really determine who that allows you to broaden that list. And so your action step for this is to do this. Brainstorm a list of people to pray for. Brainstorm a list of people that you're going to pray for, right? So go beyond just those top three things that you tend to pray for, those top three people, and really brainstorm, right? Sit down and think of all the people you know you need to pray for. And so you might sit down and you might, you know, start listing out family members and listing out friends and listing out coworkers and listing out church members, listing out people who've asked you to pray for them, listing out people you don't like, listing out people who have cats, listing listing out people who you don't like who have cats, right? Like just a long list of everybody you need to pray for. Now here's the thing about this. You don't have to pray for every single one of these people every day. That's not the purpose of this. Right? There may be some people on this list who you want to pray for daily. But then there may be some people on this who you know you need to pray for them. But it might be once a week or once a month or once every few weeks. Right? It, it's something that you, you do a little bit more sporadically, but you make sure that you're intentional about praying for them because if you're honest right now, you're, not, you're probably not praying for them at all. Right? And so you're building that into your life. 
And so the first thing you're doing is you're determining who. The next thing you want to do, step two, is you want to determine what. What are you going to pray for? And this is a little bit different because what it means is not just who are the people you're going to pray for, but maybe what are some of the issues you need to pray for? What are some of the bigger things you need to pray for? Maybe you want to be praying for your community or praying for your political leaders or the, the leaders of your church, right? Maybe you want to be praying for the issue of poverty that exists around you or just certain situations that you find yourself in or other people are finding themselves in. And so you're lifting, lifting these things up in prayer. And one of the important tools to use here for this and really for the people you're going to pray for is this next thing. Your action step here is to be specific about each thing that you're praying for. Be specific about each thing that you're praying for. And I would say that this also applies to the people you're praying for. Be specific about what it is you want to pray for when it comes to that person or, to, or for that thing. All right, so instead of just saying, dear God, I pray for my church, Right, what is it about your church that you want to pray for? What is going on in your church? Right? Maybe there are certain situations that are happening in your church, certain things that are coming up on the calendar. You want to pray for that event specifically. Right? Are there certain uh, struggles that your church is going through, and you want to pray for those? When it comes to praying for people in your life, right? instead of just saying, dear God, thank you for my family, or dear God, watch over my family, what do you want God to watch over? What is it that your family is going through? How can you get specific and really focus on what's going on in their lives? Right? Or maybe when it comes to poverty, right? What, what is it specifically about poverty you want to pray for? What's a poverty situation you've been in? What's a real struggle in your community? How can you dive deeper into that? And then in each and every one of these things, right, you want to be incorporating those three big purposes of prayer that we learned about in this Thessalonians passage. Right? You want to be giving thanks in each of these areas. Instead of just praying for poverty, where can we give thanks that God has been at work helping people, changing lives of those who are impoverished? Where can we celebrate what God's done? Right, where can we be spending time in all of these areas just listening and discerning God's will in these areas, discerning God's voice, where the Spirit is leading us in, in maybe our interactions with a particular person or the way we love our church and the things we're doing in our church? Where is it that you need to seek salvation and really ask for God to forgive you and seek repentance? Right, maybe when it comes to the person in your life or something going on in your church or when it comes to poverty, there's things that you've just left undone. And so you're getting specific about what's going on in each of these areas and really broadening your prayer and diving deep. And once you've done that, right, once you've defined who, once you've defined what, the third thing that's important to do is define when. Determine when. Determine when you are going to pray. And the simple way to do that is your final action step, which is this. Place the who and the what on certain dates. Place the who and the what on certain dates on your calendar. All right, so take those people you know you need to pray for, take those things that you know you want to pray for, and begin to put them on your calendar. And like I said, there might be some that make it on there daily, and you just write the name or you write the thing on there every single day. There might be some things you do monthly. There might be some things that you do quarterly, but you start to put them into your calendar. And what's really valuable here is to put this calendar next to your personal calendar or your work calendar. Because as you look at it, you might be inspired about other things to pray for. Like you might notice that somebody's going to be having surgery on this day, and so for the whole week leading up to it, you want to put their name down every single one of those days so you can be praying before they go into surgery. Right? And make sure to put it down there on that day so you can call them and pray for them that day. Or maybe when it comes to big holidays or big celebrations, right? People have birthdays. You want to spend some special time giving thanks for that person on that day. Or your anniversary, right? Pretty good thing to remember, right? So you put that on there. You pray for that. You just tell her you've prayed for her. Now you don't need to get her a gift, right? You prayed for her. Shouldn't that be good enough? I mean, this is the sort of thing you can do with this calendar is just build these things in. And it's going to inspire you with things to pray about as you go through it. And so what you can hopefully see through each of these steps, right, determining who, determining what, determining when, is that this is meant to make prayer something that encompasses all of your life. That it is just this, this shroud that covers every area of your life. And that's, that's the importance of prayer, right? We want it to be in every area of our lives. But there is one more thing that's really important for us to do. And that's our bonus step, which is this. In addition to determining who and what and when, 
We also need to make sure every single day to plan for thy will be done. If anything you've learned in this series, I hope you've learned that the importance, the purpose of prayer is not to seek our will, and not to just make our requests. I mean, prayer is about sharing our heart with God, but more importantly than anything, prayer is about us seeking God's will. Thank God, this is what I can think of, this is what I care for, but in the end, not my will be done, but yours. That's what creates powerful prayer. That's what allows for God to break through when we surrender ourselves to God. And so as you're creating this calendar, creating it reminders Create in it plans so that whatever you're praying for, whoever you're praying for, not only do you list what's on your heart, but you seek God's will. I mean, that's what Paul's really getting at here, isn't it? Every one of these steps that he teaches us, every one of these important things that he highlights about prayer, giving thanks to God and rejoicing in what God's done, that's this moment of just surrendering and saying, instead of what I want, God, I want to celebrate what you've done. Right, when it comes to not quenching his spirit and listening to prophecy, it's, God, I don't want to just hear my own voice. I want to hear your voice. Or when it comes to repentance and salvation, it's saying, God, I know I can't do this on my own. I need you, and so I surrender to you. Every bit of our lives is meant to surrender to God. And so that's how I want to end this message today. I really just want to invite you to take a moment and surrender. And say, God, not my will be done, but yours. God, I want to I surrender to you each and every day. I want to surrender to you my time. I want to surrender to you my calendar so that in everything I'm doing your will, in everything that's going on in my life, I'm giving myself to you and letting you have it all. And so I want to end this message today with a song. It's a song called Gracefully Broken. And uh, some members of our choir are going to sing it, but I want to invite you to sing along. We'll have the words there for you. I want, I want to invite you to sing this song and just, and just surrender to God in this moment. Realize that it is by the grace of our God, by the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, that we have hope, that we have salvation, that any of this matters. By that grace, we're broken. Through that grace, our broken pieces can be put back together. And so we're going we're gonna to play this song right now, and I just want to invite you to just surrender and let God speak into your heart right now and in the weeks and days and months to come. Let's sing together. Did you have that up there for any of it? Okay, good. All right, I'm going to end with a prayer. It's, yeah, just me. Not that, yeah. Still on me? Okay. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks that no matter how broken we are, no matter how much we mess up, no matter how much we try to control our own lives, that your grace is abundant. And that when we surrender to that grace, we are healed and forgiven and transformed. So transform us today, God. Make us into the people you desire us to be to do the work that you're calling us to do. Draw us close to you each and every day through this gift of prayer that every day we might surrender. And God, every day through that surrender, you might transform us and the world around us through the power of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.